your way with the subject economics. I'm your usual facilitator, Sir Walter. Today is another day for another interesting topic in economics. Like we do always, hold all other factors constant except your attention for this presentation. And I bet you, you're going to have some in-depth knowledge about the topic and it's going to help you, the Form 3 student, in the upcoming WASI. It is going to help you, the Form 2 student, to learn ahead as well as the Form 1 student. So our topic for today is money, inflation, and financial institutions. So you realize that you see three different subject matters here. It is not for any ordinary reason that we have these three. These three subject matters go hand in hand. We talk about money and we must talk about inflation. We talk about inflation and money and we must talk about financial institutions. As we delve into the presentation, you will understand why we are talking about these three subject matters together. So, for our objectives tonight, I would expect you, the student, to be able to define money, inflation, and deflation. Again, you should be able to explain functions of money, demand for money, and supply of money. What is more, you should be able to explain causes of inflation and its effect on the functions of money. Yes, yeah, so by doing this, we would also talk about the financial institutions. And lastly, you solve some questions relating to the topic. And what's the topic? We are talking about money, inflation, and financial institutions. Having gone through this, we are good to go. I want you to pick your pens, your jotes, or books whilst we go through this. And jot those important points that I'll give you to help your studies. So we'll start with the definition of money. What is money? Of course, money is something very common in our social lives. Some say money is life. Money is necessary for our movement. You would notice that anything we do, money is involved. So what is this money? I know you are trying to give out some definitions of money especially with those of you who have not read about money as a topic in economics. All your casual definitions may be true, but how do we present money as a definition in a technical way? For example, perhaps. Let's go through it. Money is anything which is legally accepted for the purchase of goods and services and the payment of debt. I'll take it again. Money is anything which is legally accepted for the purchase of goods and services and the payment of debt. All right. So in this definition, you would notice that we have the word legal. Legal is found in this definition. Also, we have purchase of goods and services. And lastly, we have payment of debt. Now, take a look closely at this definition. It means money is anything but not anything. I say this because. When we talk about anything, 
we are looking at anything which is legally accepted anything with that legal backing so if we have something that does not have the legal backing to be money it is not money so money should be anything which is legally accepted for what for the payment of goods and services and the payment of debt so for instance if somebody owes you the person would have to pay back with money because that is what is legally accepted if somebody wants goods from you as a seller or a producer the person can get the goods in exchange for money because that is what is legally accepted for the payment of goods and exchange in that sense and we also talk about payment of debt good there is another definition of money which says that it is anything accepted as the medium of exchange measure of value store of value standard for deferred payment when you look at this definition it is a bit technical but it is not difficult to understand why do i say this if we have to go through this particular subject of money you would notice that this definition is easy to understand i want you to stay put and relax for the second definition for now subsequently when we talk about some terms and concepts under this topic you will understand perfectly what the second definition means now the second definition is described as the functional definition of money the functional definition of money yes and like i said subsequently you will understand so having gone through the definition of money let us now focus our attention on some terms relating to money some terms relating to money yes money is very common of course we all know money but there are some technicalities as far as money is concerned there are some technicalities surrounding money and we need to talk about some of these concepts to unravel those technicalities that comes with the usage of money the first one is legal tender when we say legal tender or when we term anything as legal tender it means it is anything backed by law to be used as money so back to the definition of money where we said money is anything legally accepted so for money to be money it has to be a legal tender so the notes and coins we use in our various economies various countries is a legal tender and why is it a legal tender it is a legal tender because it is generally and legally accepted or we say it is backed by law to be used or seen as money so that is it the next one is the quasi money or we say the near money what is the quasi money it is an asset that can easily be turned into money when we talk about quasi money it is not money in itself but it is something closer to money all right meaning you cannot use the quasi money in exchange of goods and services in that sense all right but it is money because you can easily change that asset into money what are some of the things you can easily change as assets into money is it car is it building no you realize that you put a house for sale and it takes a while but talk about a check when you take a check to the bank you can easily cash money with it when you take bankers draft you know in some few years when there wasn't any free shs the bankers draft was very common in the payment of school fees with secondary schools you go and pay money in the bank 
and you go to school with a banker's draft. The bank issues this banker's draft to parents, and the parent will take them to the schools, various schools, and the school's accountant or the school's bezer can easily go to the bank and cash out the money with the banker's draft. So that is near money, but it is not money. You cannot use the banker's draft in the market to buy, let's say, vegetables. It is not done. So quasi money is not actually money, but it is closer to money because it can easily be turned into money. So that's the difference between money and quasi money. Now let's go on. We have what is called the token money. When we say token money, we are looking at money whose intrinsic value is unrelated to its face value. Well, in some textbooks, you would see token money defined as money whose intrinsic value is higher than the face value. In other literature, you would see token money defined as money whose intrinsic value is less than the face value. But when we marry the two, we can say that token money is any money whose intrinsic value is unrelated to the face value. And that will give a perfect definition of it. Now, when we talk of intrinsic value, we are looking at the value of the commodity itself. Let's take, for instance, the one CD coin. The cost of producing this one CD may be more than the one CD. In this case, the intrinsic value is the cost of producing the one CD. All right? But the face value is one CD. So you notice that in this sense, the intrinsic value is higher than the face value. Take the 200 CD note, for example. It is highly possible that the cost of producing the 200 CD note may be less than the face value. So in that case, you notice that the 200 CD note has its intrinsic value in this sense lower than the face value. And all these will be classified as token money. So the definition of token money is that money which its intrinsic value is unrelated to its face value. Moving on, let's talk about commodity money. Commodity money is anything used as money in the past. All right? So this brings us to what commodity or commodities have been used in the past as money. So we'll go through some brief history about money, what money or how money came about. Money itself started not at the time of Adam, but it evolved as the years went by. So you notice that in the past, people were just searching for food, hunting. Hunting was the economic activity, the common economic activity, where people were moving from one place to another searching for food. It got to a time, the agricultural revolution, where people started cultivating food for themselves. Now, due to the differences in endowment of various places, you couldn't have all that you need at a particular locality you find yourself. So people started gathering what they have, moving to places to find what they don't have, and exchange what they have with what they don't have. And that brought about the butter system. So we're using commodities in exchange for other commodities. It got to a time there was that suggestion by powers of the world at the time that why don't we use a particular commodity to serve as a medium of exchange? And several of these commodities were used to serve as medium of exchange. So you don't need to bring any commodity in exchange for another commodity. We just have to use one commodity. Some of these commodities that have been used as money in the past, we can have salt, even cattle, tobacco, curries, all these and more 
have been used in various cultures as money. So, one thing with commodity money is that it pertains to a particular culture or it pertains to a particular vicinity or a particular community. So, for instance, you can have community A where cowries were used. You can have commodity B where cattle was used. You can have commodity C where metals were used. So that is commodity money. So this commodity money faced some challenges and it evolved into what we have today as the currencies and note we have. It got to a time where gold or precious metals were used as money. Because of its bulky nature and other problems associated with it, there was the need to have gold coins. And with the gold coins, people were having fake gold or they have metals and use gold plates on it. So evil money came to replace good money at the time. And that was also a problem. So authorities at the time declared and issued some papers or some designs that they call it money. And that is what we are going to talk about next. Fiat money. Fiat money is currency which becomes money by the act of an by the act of government. Or we say it is money, which government says it is money. And this is a, a famous quote by one of the economists in the past. Fiat money is money which is money because government says it is money. So some some designs were made in the form of notes and coins and the authorities said this is money and we all accepted that it is money in modern times the money we have to a large extent describes modern fiat money because when you take any currency the dollar the cd the pound the euros what any other currency it is designed by the authorities of the country the government and government says use this as money so money evolved from the butter system to the commodity money to the gold or precious metals the gold coins the fiat money and what have you now we have another term known as a fiduciary issue the fiduciary issue is currency used by the government which is not backed by gold so those days when we had a blacksmith they are the first bankers who were keeping gold for people they keep your gold and they give you receipt and your receipt is backed by gold but receipt being backed by gold at the time was a limitation to transactions it means you need to have some gold before you can transact business or you can buy or sell so government made it easier for people to buy and sell without having gold so that issue that were made which was which was not backed by gold is the fiduciary issue so you realize that when you look at the evolution of money it has gone through lots of stages and i've just given you a brief history about it then we also have value of money when we say value of money it is the amount of goods and services money can buy at a particular time. The value of goods and services money can buy at a particular time is seen as a value of money. Of course, you can have 1 million currency A, you can have 1 CD currency B. If your 1 million currency A buys less goods compared to that one currency B, then we'll say that the value of currency B is somewhat higher than the value of currency A. I hope you get it. Of course, we can use Zimbabwe as an example. You know, the Zimbabwean dollar lost its value in a harsh manner 
to the point that you could even have 100 million Zimbabwean dollars and it can't buy anything satisfactory. Of course, the pound sterling is doing well in Africa. The dollar is doing well in Africa. You can have some few dollars, you change the various local currencies in Africa and you notice that it can buy something worth more than what a Zimbabwean dollars could buy. So you notice that the value of money is dependent on the amount of goods and services that money can buy. So there is a formula for the value of money or value for money. And this is the formula for value for money. It is the nominal income or we say the nominal value or we can also say the face value divided by price. The face value divided by price. Suppose the value of money in, let's say, Ghana is measured this way. So you have 50 cities, which is the nominal value of the face value and the price levels. The price you see there is not just price, but price levels. And the price you see there is 10. The value of money in this case, as I'm representing by V, will be equal to the nominal money, which is 50 CDs, over the price, which is 10, and the value is 5. So that is the value for money. That is how we calculate the value for money. Okay. So we talk about the nominal money, as I said. It is a money that is not adjusted for price changes. It is the money or the face value of the money that exists at a particular time. We don't take price changes into consideration. As soon as we adjust this nominal value of money or the nominal money for price changes, it becomes real money. So real income is money which is adjusted for price changes. Real income in this case is money adjusted for price changes. So take note. We move on. Characteristics of money. For anything to be money, it should hold certain qualities, certain characteristic features. And that is what we want to talk about now. Durability. By no other, I want to start with durability. Money should be durable. You know, you can't have money today and tomorrow the money has faded to the extent that you cannot recognize it. Like some receipts we get at the supermarket. You know, when you, when you go to buy things at the supermarket or at various shops, gadget shops, they give you a receipt, you keep the receipt for two years or something, you go and retrieve the receipt and you realize that it has faded. You can't even recognize what, what is written on it. If money has that particular feature. It means it is not durable and it wouldn't be a good quality for money. Right. Money should be durable in such a way that as time goes on, it should look the same. It should not be ruined in such a way that it cannot be recognized as money. So when you look at advanced economies, the money is like, is like rubber. You can crumple it and it will come back to normal. In other jurisdictions, they try to put certain features on it that makes it unique and durable. And that is money. Money should be durable. Money should be portable. Money should be portable. Just imagine that my, the size of one, let's say one CD, is like the normal size of a brick block. A brick block is one CD. And your father gives you money for school. Let's say your father gives you 500 CDs for school. 
It means you are going to have that size of the block, 500 pieces. Imagine, where will you keep them? Will it be in your chop box? Or it will be in your trunk? Or it will be in your traveling bag? You can't even carry them. All right? Let us assume that money is the big block. Who is the richest person on earth? Well, we can't bother ourselves with that because it's not part of what we are learning. But let us take one of the famous people on earth who is rich, Bill Gates. Suppose that Bill Gates has about $100 million and $1 is like the size of the brick. Where is he going to keep those monies? You realize that if money is of that nature, then it is an issue. So, for money to be a good money, it should be portable. When we say portable, it means that it should be easily carried around. So you notice that you can have 500 CDs on you as your pocket money for school. You would walk around and nobody will even know you have the 500 CDs with you. With two of the 200 CD notes, with 100 CD notes, you have three notes and that is good as 500 CDs. That is the portability we are talking about. Right. Money should also be divisible. When we say money should be divisible, you should be able to break money into smaller units. That is why in various economies, the money or the currency we use have smaller denominations, such that if you use a bigger denomination to buy something which is of a low value, you'll be able to get your change in the divisible sense. So that is also a characteristic feature of money. Let's move on. Uniformity. Of course, if we say one CD, one CD should be the same everywhere. We shouldn't have blue one CD, green one CD suppose, red one CD. It should be uniform. Uniformity. Dollar should be the same everywhere it finds itself. It should be scarce. It should be scarce. Of course, I know you're asking yourself the question, ah, we all need money. Why should money be scarce? If we all should have money, think about this. If we all should have more than enough money, who will sell? If we should all have enough money, who would work? Who would drive the bus? Who would drive the commercial vehicle? Who will sit in the bank for you to come and withdraw your money? Nobody will do that. At least money should be scarce so that it becomes money. For money to be money or perform its functions very well, it should be scarce. So take note. Acceptability. Everybody must accept money. You notice that when money is seen, obviously smiles are found everywhere because of the high acceptability nature of money. If there is money which is not accepted, then money is, is losing its function as money. So take note of that. All right, moving on. How money has solved the problem of butter? I told you we started with the hunting thing and we came to butter and we came to commodity money and now we are having money, the modern day money. How has money solved the problems of butter? Double coincidence of want has been solved by money. You see, in the butter system, where you exchange one good for another, before you can successfully exchange your good with one another person, you would have to look for somebody who has what you want and is willing to give to you. At the same time, that person should also want what you have. And that is a double coincidence of one. You have to look for a person. Let's say you have tomatoes. You want onion. You would have to look for somebody who has tomatoes and is looking for... Let's say you have tomatoes, sorry. You want onion. You have to look for somebody who has onions and is looking for tomatoes. That sounds difficult, right? Yes. Today, we have money and we don't think about double coincidence of want. You want 
onions, you pick money. You go to the market, you get them. You want tomatoes, you pick money, you get to the market, you get them. Also, money has solved the problem of divisibility. It was difficult to do divisibility. Now, let's see. You have a big cow. You just need some tablespoons of salt. How do you exchange your big cow for two spoons of salt? And what amount of the cow can you, can you break into to get the salt? It was difficult to do that. But with money, we have bigger denominations, smaller denominations. It is easy to get change. So money has solved that problem. The problem of lending and borrowing has also been solved. How? Of course, let's say I want to do a party. You have a fattened cow. I come to borrow your cow. And by the time I'm paying back, I'm bringing a skinny cow. And I tell you, oh, but every cow is a cow. See how, how problematic this could be? Of course. You cannot, you may not get the same thing in exchange of what you have. So borrowing was a problem, lending was a problem in that sense. But with money, the value is the same. You want 50 CDs, you get your 50 CDs, you pay back 50 CDs. That's it. The problem of portability has been solved. Just imagine, you have 200 million cow. Space to keep them will be a problem. But if you have $200 million, it is not a big deal to keep it. Yes. So portability is solved in that sense. Measure of value. It was very difficult to measure the value. How many cups of rice was going to equate a goat, perhaps? It was difficult to measure. But with money, we just place price tags on them and we are good to go. So you notice that all these problems have been solved with money. Now we move on to demand for money. Demand for money. Why do we demand money? We demand money for three major reasons. Let's talk about them. Demand for money itself is the amount of money desired by people. Or the desire of people to hold in an economy. That is demand for money. We have the transactions motive. That's one of the reasons why we hold money. Transactions motive for holding money. That is holding money for day-to-day -day transactions. You would take a car to school. You would eat. You would drink. All these things, you need money. And it happens daily. So keeping money for daily transactions is what is termed Transactions motive for holding money. We can have the precautions motive or the precautionary motive for holding money. Money for unseen circumstances. It is possible that you may fall ill. You don't plan to fall ill. It just comes. And when it comes, you have some money to cushion you. So that money you would leave behind for any eventualities is termed the precautionary motive for holding money. System the precautionary motive for holding money. All right. Precautionary motive for holding money. Then we also have the third one, which is a speculative motive for holding money. Money set aside to take advantage of the financial market. All right. You know, people will just put some money aside to take opportunities in the lottery failed. Some people will wait and use the money, they will set this money aside to buy some treasury bills, to buy some bonds, to buy some shares. So the money put aside to explore the financial market is what is termed speculative motive for holding money. So that's it. So when you want to hold money to make more money, that is speculative motive for holding money. If you want to hold money to keep up with transactions on a daily basis, transactions motive for holding money. If you keep money for unforeseen circumstances, that is precautionary motive for holding money. So when we talk of demand for money, 
to a large extent at this level we are looking at these three stages right now let's move on supply of money you know anytime we talk of demand it is likely we'll talk about supply what is supply of money supply of money is the amount of currency found in an economy at a particular time amount of money found in an economy at a particular time and how do we measure the money in economy we have ways of measuring money in economy and it is peculiar to various economies in ghana for instance this is how we measure supply of money so in the measurement of supply of money we have what is called the m0 m0 is the notes and coins in the economy the notes and coins in your in your wallet in your purse at your bedside in the money box that is measuring supply of money using m0 if you are measuring supply of money using m0 then it will be the note and coins in circulation but if you want to measure supply of money using the m1 approach then it will be everything in m0 which is the note and coins in circulation in addition we talk about demand deposit as money have in the bank demand deposit all right so if you want to measure supply of money using m1 approach that's it you can also use the m2 approach the m2 approach is everything in m1 plus time deposits so we talk about nodes we talk about coins in circulation as well as demand deposits then we add time deposit when we talk of time deposit we are looking at fixed deposit we are looking at treasury bills we are looking at treasury notes you know those kind of monies you put there that you withdraw at a defined or specific time with interest then we have m3 if you want to measure money using the m3 approach then m3 is everything in m2 that means we are talking about notes and coins in circulation in addition demand deposit then we also add time deposit then we talk about non-bank income so the income in the insurance company the pension houses you know those are non-banking institutions so the monies that we found we, we, we find there will also be part of money supply if you are measuring money supply using the m3 approach so this is how we measure money in ghana it is quite similar with other economies but every economy has its measurement to be in a unique sense take note now to our question of the day to our question of the day as you see on your screens the question of the day explain four traditional functions of money you see all this well we've skipped the functions of money just because it is part of the question of the day so as we have our question of the day on the screen i would want you to think about it and subsequently we will announce the phone lines so that you can make input and win some reward for yourselves so i repeat the question of the day explain four traditional functions of money explain four traditional functions of money i hope you are ready all right so we would want to take a short breather and after that we'll come back to address the question of the day be alert with your phones whilst i would announce the phone lines after the break so let's take the break for now
Are you in class 4, 5 or 6? It is now your turn to have a bite of the Joy Learning Cherry. Get ready for our all new upper primary lessons here on Basic Classroom. As I mentioned, my objects you check to find if you have that same object. We promise an exciting and interactive TV classroom experience. We have the stand, television, a computer monitor. With our proficient and intellectual TV teachers, no problems will be left unsolved. The four that we have at the end will be represented on the ones. We will take our time and take you through the curricula from beginning to end. We look at a very useful Joy Learning TV lessons. Come on, grab your remote and tune in to Joy Learning Channel on Multi TV and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Joy Learning TV. Basic Classroom shows Monday to Friday at 4.30pm with a repeat at 6am. Joy Learning, keep learning. News is better served when they are captured by the right lenses and aired on the most appropriate channels. We first came to you as Campus 360, but we are now Edu News 360 because we have evolved to become better and bigger, bringing you once a week educational news on Ghana's first educational channel, Joy Learning. Education helps us get exposure to new ideas and concepts that we can use to appreciate and improve the world around us and the world within us. As a science student, I never relaxed, but I actually decided to cross and extend my boundaries. We have explored many campuses and indeed many achievers have been celebrated and it is time we delve deeper into more educational stories and project the success stories in the various schools. We will continue to capture and serve you stories from academics, sports, entertainment and culture. Just know that Campus 360 is now Edu News 360. Let's journey through various schools and educational related events as we update you on happenings in our educational sector and celebrate the success stories and achievements on your favorite educational TV channel, Joy Learning. Edge News 360 shows every Saturday at 10 a.m. on Joy Learning. of no or confusing road signs can be likened to driving in a dungeon. Schools that Ashanti are ready to battle for supremacy and the bragging rights as the best school in debate. Best in debate. Can't St. Monica's Girls Senior High School defend the title? Or will any of the 15 schools, including Owas, Prempe College, Yasantua Girls Senior High School, TIMAS, Presby SHTS, Bompata, Kenyo SDSHS, Tepa SHS, and the like, wrestle it from them? Make a date from Friday, 17th June to Friday, 15 July 2022, as you get thrilled to fierce and insightful arguments in the Love FM High School debate from Senior High School. In Ashanti. Catch the action live on Facebook at LUV 99.5 FM, on radio on Love 99.5 FM, and on Joy Prime and Joy Land on Monday to Friday at 2 p.m. each day at the Christian Service University College. This event is brought to you by your super station, Love 99.5 FM, in collaboration with the Ashanti Regional SRC, the Ghana Education Service, and the Conference of Heads of Assisted Secondary Schools, CHAS. I'm going to put the phone lines out there and you make your phone ins with your answers and you get your gift. You go away with your gift. So the phone lines 030-2211705 or 030-2211706. I repeat. 030-2211705. Zero three zero two two one one seven zero six. So keep the calls coming and get lucky with a gift. Yes. Whilst we wait for the question of the day. Yes. So four people, you just call, you give me one of the functions, and you are lucky to go.
Okay. So whilst we wait, we do something, right? So when they come, we continue. So these are the answers actually. I'm going to skip them, then talk about the butter system. So the butter system. Butter system was the system where goods were exchanged for other goods, like I made mention. And this happened prior to the days of money. So, like I said, you have something that you want to give out for another thing you need, and that's the butter system. And this butter system came with some problems. And I made mention of those problems, and we said money came to solve them. So what are some of these problems that the butter system faced? Double coincidence of want. Okay, Osman. Oh, we lost him. Please keep the calls coming and get lucky. Keep the calls coming and get lucky. So we have the butter system where we talk about the double coincidence of want, like I was explaining. You would need to look for someone who has what you need and also is ready to give you what you need on one hand. Then you would also have what the person needs on the other hand and you are ready to give that to the person. That was difficult. And it was creating a lot of problems. There was also the issue of exchange rate. There was an issue of exchange rate. That is, we want like we, we, we couldn't find the amount of goods that could be exchanged for another. We couldn't find amount of goods that could be exchanged for another. Then also, we have the problem of indivisibility. Indivisibility. Yes, Osman, you are back. Let's hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, welcome to the show. You are cancer. All right, so let's hear your answer. Uh, so, uh, I'm a teacher. You are a teacher, okay. Yeah, in a lower primary. Okay. Mm, I I enjoy your show, and I'm pleading you can add lower primary lessons to your program. Okay, we have you in mind, and we'll satisfy you in due course. Okay. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you for calling. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So let's continue. We have the problem of storage the problem of storage you couldn't store commodities that might especially with perishable goods you may have so much of perishable goods and since you don't have anybody to exchange with they get ruined and your wealth is gone down the drain that was a problem but with money you can store it there was also the problem of lending. Lending. You give a commodity to someone and the person is bringing it back. And the person brings something less quality than what you gave the person. And that was creating a lot of problems. So these problems were solved. Money solved the butter problems. And we've already talked about it. Now, let us go back to talk about the functions of money, traditional functions of money. So, we said these problems were associated with the butter in the meantime, but I said we should go back to talk about. Mohammed, yeah. welcome to the show. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm very, very happy to listen to this uh, program. Okay. 
May, may, may Allah help you people. Amen. Yeah, I'm also I, I'm also a, a classroom teacher, primary okay. school. Okay. And I would be happy if um, uh, if basic level program will be included. Yeah. Yeah. So that so that we can we 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 can all benefit from it. Sure. Sure. Like like I told your other colleague, we have you in yes. mind, and there's yes. something underway for you. So just stay tuned. Be with us. Yeah, Zainab. Yes. Yeah. Let's hear you. Yes, Welcome yes, to the show. Zainab. Zainab, are you there? Oh, okay. So, we'll go through it. Functions of money. We'll first start with medium of exchange. Money serves as the medium of exchange. That is one of the traditional functions of money. And we say this because money is generally accepted for the purchase of goods and services and the payment. Yeah, Enoch. Hello, Enoch. Yes, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. All right. So my suggestion is, it's a medium of exchange. Okay. And standard of effect. No, no, you have to give one of the one of the functions, just one. So which one are you going for? Okay, it's a medium of exchange. Okay, so how do you explain that? How do I explain? Yes, the medium of exchange. As the function okay. of money. As a function. As a function of money. How do you explain that? You, you use the money to buy goods and services to obtain other goods. So okay, so is it only for buying goods and services? Okay. Is money used for buying goods, goods and services? Yes, sir. All right. So okay. thank you for your answer. Please hold on and speak to our producers for your gift. All right. Now, Sylvia. Yes. Sylvia. Yes. Yes. Welcome to the show. Okay. All right. Let me hear your answer. Yes. Yeah. Please, money set as a standard of deferred payment. Standard of deferred payment. Good. So, how do you explain that? Right. Um, money allows individual um, business and government agencies like to buy and pay to buy today and pay later. Good. Sylvia, thank you. Congratulations. Your answer is correct. Please hold on and speak to our producers. All right, all right for your gift. Good. So keep your calls coming and be lucky. Two people are already lucky. We have two more to go. So keep your calls coming. So like I was saying, money serves as a medium of exchange. That is, money is generally accepted for the purchase of goods and services. Not only that, but also for the payment of debt, like we said. And for money to have this definition, it's fit for it to be described as medium of exchange. Now, the second one is unit of exchange or measure of value. We say money is used to measure the value of any given item. And this makes it easy to compare items, actually. So, when you want to buy anything, we put a price tag on it. And the price tag is related to money, sort of. So, we use money to measure the value of any given item. It is used to measure the value of any given item. And that is one of the traditional functions of money. Now, to another function of money. store of value this makes it possible to save money and use it at a future date you save money okay michael welcome to the show oh we lost him so keep your calls coming 0302211705 0302211706 and be lucky all right so store of value this makes it possible 
for the save uh, uh, for you to save money and use it at a future date it is not possible to keep raw tomatoes and use it later in a long future so let's say you want to organize a christmas party so you have tomatoes in january how oh priscilla welcome to the show okay so please give us a, your answer uh, okay um Please turn the volume of your TV set down so that we can hear you clearly. Okay, and um, my my answer is um, my answer is money serves as a store of value. Money serves as a store of value. How do you explain that? Yes. Um. If I, I want to say that at first the butter trade, mm -hmm. they don't they don't usually. Um, save their the their, their perishable goods, but due to money you can sell it and save your money at the bank. All right. You. Your answer is correct. Congratulations. Please hold on and speak to our producers for your gift. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. You are the last person. Hello, Yusuf. Can you hear me? Hello, Yusuf. Oh, we lost him. So keep keep the calls coming. We have the last person, last lucky person to win a gift. So like we are saying, you cannot keep the tomatoes in January and expect it to be in its fine state in December for the party. But you can keep some 500 CDs in January and use it for the party in December. So that is what money does. So. We talk about the last one, standard for deferred payment. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the show. Hello. Yes, hello. What is your name? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I hear you. All right. So tell us your name and give us the answer. Mm -hmm. my, my answer is money is used to help poor in society. Money is used to help the poor in society. Yes. Okay. That is a very good attempt. You know, the question was asking for the traditional functions of money. And unfortunately, that is not a traditional function of money. Nice attempt. You can call back after you've revised your note and you'll be lucky. All right. Thank you for calling. All right, so standard for deferred payment. It is possible to buy an item and pay at a later date. So because of money, we can buy something and pay later. So people buy something today and finish payment of it five years time. And it is money that has that function. You cannot use commodities for that function. Money gives us that laxity to do it. So I'm still waiting for the last person to call, the last lucky person to call for this answer. So we, we just talked about the butter system and we talked about the problems of the butter system where we said there is double coincidence of want. There is also exchange rate problems. There is indivisibility, storage lending problems then we are talking about now how money has solved this issue we already mentioned that so let's go through it quickly we said money acts as a medium of exchange that's a function of money and it solves the double coincidence of want like i was telling you because money is used legally for the exchange of goods and services and the payment of debt you don't need to look for somebody who wants what you have and you also want what he or she has so that problem is solved with money as a measure of value it solves the problem of exchange rate now we don't have to bother ourselves to know which amount of or which cups of rice perhaps 
will equate a goat or which which bags of wheat will replace another thing so that problem is also solved with a function of money the problem of indivisibility is solved with money because money in itself is divisible as we said we have smaller notes so that any amount you want you can get as change then we have store of value which is associated with money solves the problem of storage we don't have to store commodities and get it perished we can sell off the commodities and keep the money and use the money as and when it is due then for standard for deferred payment it makes money solve the problem associated with lending you don't have to worry whether the person replacing your commodity is coming with a less quality good because money has this uniformity nature such that when the person borrows let's say 100 cities and the person is coming back with 100 cities it is 100 cities holding all other factors constant so you notice that money has brought some successes as far as the problems of butter is concerned but let us ask ourselves this question has money achieved 100 percent success in its function or in its functions let's look at the next item to see if this question is answered for us inflation inflation is a subject matter that worries the function of money a lot in what sense let us first know what inflation is and let's see how inflation affects these functions of money so by way of definition inflation is the persistent and appreciable increase in the general price levels of goods and services now look at the definition persistent appreciable increase so we talk about general price levels and we associate the general price levels with an increase and not just increase we qualify this increase with two adjectives persistent appreciable so if the general price levels are increasing persistently or they are increasing continuously and that increase which is continuous is appreciable then there is inflation in recent times inflation is a common phenomenon across economies almost every economy is experiencing inflation why do we say that because we we've seen appreciable and persistent rise in price levels as far as goods and services are concerned in the various economies and that's the definition for inflation forms of inflation forms of inflation inflation could be described as a hyper one or a galloping one or a runaway one so when we say hyperinflation or galloping inflation or runaway inflation what do we mean we mean the situation where the general price levels increase at alarming rate such that money loses its function so when the general price levels of goods and services are increasing persistently and in an alarming sense then we are having galloping inflation and yes galloping inflation has become common in recent times due to the global economic crisis yes another form of inflation is creeping inflation creeping inflation and by way of definition 
it occurs when the general price levels increase at smaller rate so normally when the general price levels are increasing between one percent and four percent we describe that kind of inflation as creeping inflation now i want to ask you in your respective countries are you having galloping inflation or creeping inflation you can answer yourselves yes another one is suppressed inflation it occurs when inflation rates are too low that government can use fiscal policies to control it so when we are saying they are too low it's even lower than the one percent that we talked about in creeping inf inflation so that government can even absorb the changes in prices with what is called fiscal policy yes i'm i know you are thinking about what fiscal policies are subsequently we'll describe it or we'll talk about it so don't worry so we've talked about the forms of inflation where we've mentioned galloping inflation creeping inflation suppressed inflation right we also have categories of causes of inflation now don't be confused here we have causes of inflation and these causes of inflation are several and we can categorize them under some various headings so note that the causes of inflation are there but we can categorize these causes of inflation under some headings and these headings are what we are going to talk about then we talk about the various causes that will fall under the various headings so the first one is demand pool inflation demand pool inflation what is demand pool inflation it is the persistent increase in the general price levels caused by excessive aggregate spending in excess of available supply of goods over a period of time in simple terms we are looking at the inflation which is caused when aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply so when productivity is not enough to meet the aggregate demand in the system that is that is a situation of shortage in a form and this shortage is going to cause price levels to go up and that is what is termed demand pool inflation demand pool inflation factors affecting demand pool inflation so these are the causes that would make demand pool inflation okay so when we talk of causes of inflation these are some of the causes of the inflation under demand pool increased government expenditure you know when government is spending it goes into aggregate demand those in form three if you've done national income you notice that aggregate demand which is the same as aggregate expenditure at equilibrium is equal to consumption plus investment plus government expenditure and we are if we are talking about the open economy plus export minus import so that component of government expenditure which adds to the aggregate demand when it increases it is going to cause demand pool inflation so what are some of the things government will do normally in africa during election year government push more money government spends a lot so if government is doing our government is having some flagship programs where government will have to pump in more money then government expenditure will be increasing if government is increasing salaries government expenditure is increasing all right so these are some of the things that will cause government expenditure to increase reduction in interest rate you know interest rate is some sort of benefit on investment at the same time it is a charge we pay or we make on loans when interest rates reduce it will make loans attractive and when loans become attractive a lot of people will go for the loans and demand for individuals will increase and when we measure it on the aggregate level aggregate demand is going to increase over supply 
So take note. High population growth. When a child is born, an extra mouth is available for feeding. So when more people are born or when the population is increasing, extra mouths are created for feeding. And when extra mouths are created for feeding directly, demand is going to increase at the aggregate level and this will cause demand pool inflation. We can talk about increase in money supply to finance budget deficit. Of course, budget of a particular country talks about proposed expenditure and estimated revenue. If the revenue is not enough to meet the expenditure, then government can increase money supply to meet or finance this deficit. So when government is doing this, it is going to increase aggregate demand and in the end, Demand pool inflation is caused. Then we have reduction in income taxes. Disposable income is a money available for consumption to every individual. So when your salary is being paid, government deducts some tax. That is the income tax. And what is left with you is a disposable income. If government is reducing income tax, it will make disposable income of individuals increase. You know, the more taxes, income tax government charge, the less your disposable income. So if government is reducing income taxes, then your disposable income will increase. And if disposable income increases, it is going to make your demand also increase. And when we put this in aggregation, it is going to make aggregate demand increase and demand pool inflation is caused so these are some of the causes of inflation that are categorized under demand pool inflation now let's go to the second category known as the cost push inflation before i even talk about what pertains in the cost push inflation you notice that we have the word push and we have the word pool as far as the categorization is concerned, it is very common and it is very like it is very common, yes, to, to, uh, for students to make mistakes or for students to be confused. It is possible that students might, in trying to record, might, in trying to recall, might say that we have demand push instead of demand pull and we have cost pull instead of cost push. Now, I want to clear this confusion before it even happens. Listen, when you are demanding by way of action, you do this. You pull. You demand by pulling, right? We all don't want cost. We shy away from cost. We always want to minimize cost. So when it is cost, we try to push it away. I hope you understand. So anytime you mention cost, that which should follow is push cost push demand pull demand let's do it together demand pull cost push i hope the confusion is cleared good so now let us talk about cost push inflation cost push inflation it's is the inflationary situation which arises as a result of increase in the cost of production so when cost of production increase what happens producers normally will shift that increase in the cost of production on goods that they sell today you go and buy bread the price of bread has increased you complain and the seller of the bread will tell you oh now flour is very expensive now margarine is very expensive you go to buy food and they are talking about how the raw materials have become expensive, how the cost of production have become expensive. That is why the, the good is also becoming expensive or the prices of goods and services are increasing. So if the prices of goods and services are increasing and it is causing inflation and it is for the reason that cost of production has increased, then we have cost push inflation. Now let me ask you, what kind of category of inflation do you have in your country now? Is it demand pool inflation 
or cost push inflation? Yes. I know now you can relate. Good. So, what are some of the factors affecting cost push inflation? So, we are talking about the causes of inflation which are grouped under the cost push inflation. We have increase in wages and salaries. You should know that wage and salary are prices of input. And what is that input? Labor. So when you have labor agitating for higher wages and salaries, this particular action will have a direct effect on the cost of production. And that is going to cause inflation. So if there is increase in wages and salaries, which is causing inflation, and that is the cost push inflation. We also have increase in prices of raw materials. Of course, I just gave an example of the reason why maybe prices of bread are increasing. It is because you are saying, oh, flour is now expensive and what have you. Flour is a raw material for bread. So if the price of the raw material is increasing, it is going to cause inflation. And that kind of inflation is seen as the cost push inflation. Take note. We also have increase in indirect taxes by the government. Increase in indirect taxes by the government. So you realize that indirect taxes, normally when government put these indirect taxes on raw materials, it is going to make the cost of production increase. And that is going to bring cost push inflation. Increase in transportation costs. You know, after the good has been produced, the good needs to be transported or it needs to be distributed. Now, when it's being distributed and the transportation fares are high, it is going to increase the price of goods and services. And that's also a typical example of the cost push inflation. Increase in utility tariffs. You know, we use electricity, we use water. When the charges on these or the tariffs on these utilities increase, it is going to increase goods and services sold on the market. And that is also a cause of cost push inflation. I hope now you've, you've noticed or you've learned the difference between the cost push inflation or inflationary causes and the demand pool inflationary causes. So let's do the exercise once more. Cost, push, demand, pool. Great. Now, there are other causes of inflation, okay? The cost, push, and demand pool are not the only categories of causes of inflation. We can also have other causes. Let's explore them. We have what is called imported inflation. Imported inflation. What is imported inflation? For example, let's say you are in country B and you rely on country A for goods. You rely on country A for some goods, maybe for clothing, for cars, what have you. And there is inflation in country A because you import country A's goods, country B, which is your country, will also experience inflation. Let me use definite terms. Suppose Ghana import shoes, clothing from Togo. If Togo is experiencing inflation, because Ghana is importing goods from Togo, automatically Ghana will also experience inflation. So that inflation will be caused by the importation of the goods. And that is termed imported inflation. So take note. We also have what is called bottleneck inflation. We have what is called bottleneck inflation. What is bottleneck? Bottleneck are the inefficiencies in the running of the economy or in a particular system. So there is a delay here. Somebody must meet deadline. The person will not meet the deadline. 
somebody will not do his work well, we have to spend extra costs. Or we have to spend extra money in doing the same thing. We can lose one particular thing twice because of inefficiency. All these things would increase the cost of doing things. And when the cost of doing things increase, the effect is that inflation will occur. So if inflation is occurring due to these inefficiencies in running the economy, then there is bottleneck inflation. Now I ask you another rhetoric question. Is your country experiencing bottleneck inflation? Yeah. Marked up inflation. Marked up inflation. This is the inflation which occurs when producers or sellers decide to increase prices. Of course, in some countries, there is inflation all right, which is caused by other things. But you would notice that people, some people are also taking advantage of the system. They come together to decide that, oh, let us also sell this at a higher price. Because now there is the expectation that prices are increasing. So let us increase the price because that is the expectation. And that kind of inflation is known as marked up. Is this inflation happening in your country? Yeah. You are the best person to know. Just relate it to the economy of your country and see whether it is happening. Good. Now let us look at effect of inflation on economy. Before we delve into it, is inflation always a bad thing? Of course, with what we are saying, we all agree that inflation may be a bad thing. But is it always a bad thing? The answer is no. Inflation has some good sides. Let us explore and see some of these bad and good sides of inflation. Inflation reduces the value of money. Of course, yes. What you could buy with 100 CDs maybe two years ago, you cannot buy the same amount now in the Ghanaian economy. Why? Because inflation has taken place. So this is what it means. If there is 20% inflation, what it means is that the amount of goods and services a particular money can buy will reduce by 20%. That is basically it. So the value of money is reducing when there is inflation or inflation increases money will reduce in its value. And that is a negative effect. We also have savings being affected. Money affects savings. Or sorry, inflation affects savings. When there is inflation, you would need more money to buy the same amount of goods you used to buy before. And that is affecting your savings. You would have to go and pick money from your savings to add up to the loss of value. So you notice that inflation becomes a disincentive to savings. Inflation becomes disincentive to savings. It affects lending. Of course. By the time you are lending your money to the borrower, that money can buy some amount of goods and services. By the time the borrower is coming to pay you your money, the money would have lost its value and it will not be able to buy the same amount of goods and services you were able to buy before. So it makes lending problematic. Then also, it creates economic growth. That's a good sign. How does inflation create economic growth? When prices of goods and services are increasing, that's a description of inflation, it serves as an incentive for producers to produce more because they will be getting higher profits. So they will produce more. And if productivity increases, economic growth occurs. Inflation also, with a good side, creates employment. How does it create employment? As producers are getting higher profits and they are motivated to produce more, it will lure them to employ more people for the higher production. And since they are getting more money, 
they will be in a good position to pay. And for that matter, employment is going to increase. We also have the fact that it favors borrowers, of course. By the time you go and borrow the money, the value will not be the same as the time you are going to pay the money. The value will reduce. So the borrower is better off because the borrower gets to use the money at a higher value than the lender. So after all, inflation is not always bad. It has its good sides. Good. Now measures to solve inflation. When there is inflation, what can we do to solve it? In trying to solve inflation, we can have what is called the fiscal policy measures. Then we have the monetary policy measures. Fiscal policy measures, monetary policy measures. Then we also have other policy measures. Let's talk about them. What is fiscal policy? Fiscal policy is the use of taxes and government expenditure to influence the economy. So if government is using taxes or taxation as well as expenditure to influence the economy, it means government is embarking on fiscal policy. So if government is using any of these two tools to curb inflation, then government is using fiscal policy measure. Take note. Then also, we have the monetary policy, which is the use of money supply by government to influence the economy. So in this case, Government, through the central bank, will try to control money in circulation so that inflation is solved or managed. And that is a description, clearly, of monetary policy. Let's look at some of the fiscal policy measures. Reduce government expenditure. So the government is reducing expenditure. It will solve inflation because we said one of the causes of inflation is an increased government expenditure. Good. Increase income taxes. So government is increasing income taxes. When government increases income taxes, what will happen is that government now will be able to reduce the disposable income of consumers. And that will help solve inflation. Reduction in indirect taxes on raw materials. We said cost push is caused by high prices on raw materials. So the government is reducing taxes on raw materials. It is going to reduce cost of production and inflation will be solved. Provision of subsidies. It also goes into government spending. Government provides subsidies to cushion farmers, to cushion producers so that they don't charge higher prices. Now to monetary policies. You know, when we talk about a fiscal policy, it is all about using taxation and government expenditure. Monetary policy will be about the use of money supply. Sale of securities. What are securities? We are looking at bonds, basically, and other financial instruments. Government raise bonds into the system because there is inflation, there is more money in the system. When there is inflation, it means that there is more money in the system, excess money. So government raise bonds, certificates, sell the bond. So government sell bond by, by exchanging the financial certificate, which is the bond, with money. If government does that, government is extracting money from the system. We'll talk about more of this subsequently. Increase interest rate if government increases interest rate it will deter people from taking loans it will encourage savings and money will be extracted from the system and inflation will be solved right increase cash ratio when we talk of cash ratio you know it is an amount required by commercial banks to keep in their bank vault for possible withdrawal by general customers. You know, when you go and put your money in the bank, from time to time, you can go and withdraw some of it. 
So at any given point in time, the bank would have to put some money there for you, the customer, to go and redraw at demand. Right. Then they use the rest to create more money. And the money that is used to create more money is known as excess reserve. Now, if the central bank should increase cash ratio, that means you have to keep more money in the bank and use less money to create more money. And when it happens like that, money supply reduces or shrinks. We'll talk about it more. There are other measures. And like we said with the monetary policies, you'll notice that every policy we've talked about there or every factor we've talked about there is directly linked to money supply. Good. So other measures. We have importing from cheaper sources. You know, we talked about imported inflation where we made mention of the fact that when you are importing from countries that have inflation, your country will also have inflation. So if we are importing from cheaper sources, it will solve the problem that comes with inflation or it will solve the inflation itself. Control of population growth. We made mention of the fact that when the population of a country is increasing, it is going to increase aggregate demand and inflation will occur. So there is a control of the population growth, it will solve it. Increase productivity. In demand pool inflation, we made mention of the fact that demand exceeds supply and that is what is causing price levels to increase. So by way of solving this, we have to increase productivity to meet demand so that price levels will come down. And that will solve inflation. Now, how inflation affects the functions of money. I told you, money has some successes. But are these successes 100%? The answer is no, because something is affecting it, which is inflation. So back to what we were talking about. How does inflation affect money in its functions? Money as medium of exchange. During inflation, this function is distorted because the value of money will not be stable. So people will shift their interest to, hold, to holding commodities other than money. If the value of money keeps falling because there is inflation, then what happens? People will tend to hold commodities than to hold money right if you drive no let's say you bake bread instead of you going to put your money in the bank you would rather buy flour because if you go and put the money in the bank if that money could buy five bags of flour today in the near future when you are ready to go and buy it won't be able to buy the flour, uh, five bucks and for that matter you prefer to keep the flour bags of flour than to keep money when it happens like that people will shift their interest from money to commodities and money will lose its function. So excessive inflation will cause money as a medium of exchange. Not only that, also with money serving as a measure of value. During inflation, money cannot be used to measure values of items because its value will not be stable. If we are using money to measure the value of goods and services, then the value of money itself should be stable. If the value of money is not stable, we cannot use it as a measure of value. Simple as that. So money will lose this function when there is excessive inflation. So money as store of value. Money as store of value. During inflation, this function of money is lost because money will lose its value at a future date. You cannot store value in money because the value itself that you are storing is dwindling because of inflation. In future, surely 
it will decrease. So you cannot store value in money. Lastly, money as standard for deferred payment. During inflation, the value of money may reduce and the lender may not get the same value equal to that which was given to the borrower at the particular time. You see, we talked about problem of lending. When there's inflation, by the time the borrower will pay back, the value of money will have reduced. So, money serving as a standard for deferred payment may not work when there is excessive inflation. So, in conclusion, money is good. It has solved problems in the economy. But, with excessive inflation, money will lose its traditional functions. Good. Now let's talk about deflation. Deflation is just the opposite of inflation. What is it? It's a period of persistent fall in general price levels and output over time. So, the opposite of inflation is deflation, like we said. Now, what are the causes of deflation? Increase in productivity. If now, IA supply or productivity is is exceeding demand, price levels will go down. You know, we learned in Form 2 that in the market situation, as supply increases, price falls. When goods are in abundance, why not? Price will fall, and that's going to cause deflation. A decrease in the supply of money. When there is no money in the system, people cannot afford goods and services. It will force sellers to reduce the prices of goods and services, and deflation will occur. Fall in government expenditure. If government is not spending, you know, when government spends, government push more money into the system. But if government is not spending, less money is in the system. Government doesn't push money into the system. And there's inflation. Simple. Excessive dumping. What is dumping anyway? Dumping is a situation where foreigners come to the local economy to sell goods at prices lower than the production cost. Foreigners sell in the domestic market of goods with prices lower than the production cost. So for example, if we are using Ghana as an example, Ghana is a domestic economy and Ghanaians spent 100 cities to produce a pair of shoes. And Chinese people bring their shoes into Ghana and sell it at 50 cities. It means they are selling the shoe at price below the production cost in the domestic market. That is a clear case of dumping. So when there is excessive dumping, we, we would get, or the Ghanaian economy would get goods at cheaper, way, way cheaper, cheaper, cheaper prices lower prices prices will keep reducing and that is going to bring about deflation yes dumping is not a good thing for any economy now let us have some trial questions having gone through you know this topic is a theory based so you don't have more calculations but let's manage to have this calculation now take note this form of calculation has never appeared in wasi who knows you may be lucky this year take advantage of it pick your pens and your books and let's go through it now you have a table the first column talks about price the second one face value of money real value of money is the next one and rate of price changes because it is in rate it's in percentage take note now the face value here is the nominal value now, the real value here is the nominal value adjusted by price. And the rate of change is change, uh, money changing over time, measured in percentage. Now, these are the questions. The table above shows the rate of changes in price and their effect on the real value of money. Use it to answer the following questions or the questions that follow 
First, you have to define real value of money. And we already know the real value of money. It's the amount of goods and services money can buy. We are supposed to find the value of A, B, C, D, E to complete the table. Then we solve the subsequent questions. Let's quickly go through it. Now, A talks about price. We need to solve it. B talks about rate of change in price. Now, let us tackle A first. Price. So, our value of money formula is given as the nominal income over price. For A, as we are solving, we know that our nominal income is 15,000. Value of money is 50. So, the value of money which I want to give as VM is given, right? So, we just have to put the 50 there. It's equal to the nominal income which is given as 50 or 15,000 over the price A which we are yet to find. So, our A in this case becomes the 15,000 divided by 50. And our A in this case divided by 50, our A in this case is 300. So, our A is 300. Simple as that. Now, let's find B. B is the rate of change in price. Now, let's look at the formula for rate of change in price. Rate of change in price is the new price minus the old price over the old price times 100%. We know our new price to be 500 from the table. We know our old price to be 300. That's what we found. So, from the table, our new price is 500. Good. And old price A, we, we found it. So, in this case, it will be equal to, we are finding B, right? And B is the rate of change in price. So, in this case, it will be the new price, which is 500 minus 300 old price over 300 old price times 100%. This gives us 200 over 300 times 100%. Right? This zero. Cancel this zero. So, we have... 2 divided by 3 times 100%, and the answer is 66.67. Right. Now let's find the next one, which is C. And C is the real value of money. We we'll quote the formula real value of money is given as the nominal over the price. And we know the price, we know the nominal income. So, real value, which is what we want to find, will be 24,000 in this case over 800. This 100 cancels this 100. And what do we have? We have 240 divided by 8. And our answer is 30. So, in this case, the real value of money here is 30. Now, to the next one. The face value. We need to find the face value. So, the face value, which is the nominal value. We know our real value to be 40. The nominal value is what we have to find D over the price 1,200. So, in this case, our D becomes 40 times 1,200. And what we get? 40 times 1,200 gives us 48,000. And that is our real value. Last is the rate of change. So we need to find this. That will be our new price minus the old price over the old price times 100. So in this case, our new price is 1,400. Old price is 1,002 divided by the 1,200 times 100%. So 1,400 minus 1,200 will give us 200 divided by 1,200 times 100. The zeros will cancel. So we have 2 here, 1, 2 here, 6. So we have 1 divided by 6 times 100. And the answer is 16.67.
percent. Good. So, the next question says, what economic phenomenon explain the change in the real value of money? What economic phenomenon explain the change in the real value of money from 50 units to 30 units? Let's see. From 50 units to 30 units. So from 50 units to 30 units, you realize that the face value is the same, but price is increasing. And as price is increasing, it is causing the real value of money to decrease from 50 to 30. And what economic phenomenon is that? It is inflation. So you realize that the same amount, the price has increased, and for that matter, the real value has fallen. And that explains inflation. So the economic phenomenon in this situation is inflation. All right. Now, what the next one is suggest three ways to improve the real value of money. Suggest three ways to improve the real value of money. What are the three ways to improve the real value of money? We need to tackle inflation because inflation is what is causing the real value of money to fall. Right? We need to know the determinants. And knowing the determinant to be able to solve it, think about it. We'll be talking about it subsequently. Good. So determinant for value of money. Price level. So we need to tackle price levels in order to improve the value of money. Right? We know that as price levels increase, value of money becomes worse. So we need to curb price levels so that value of money improves. Supply of money. We have to control our supply, supply of money, so that we will be able to keep the value of money or improve the value of money. Volumes of goods and services. We need to control the volumes of goods and services so that it doesn't cause the value of money to fall. Then also, velocity of circulation of money. If Money changes hands easily in an economy. You have money, you buy, you're always buying, you're always buying. If money is changing hands easily, it is making the economy boom and that is going to cause inflation, which will affect the value of money. So we have to control the velocity of circulation of money. I want you to read more about this because this can be a likely examination question. Moving on. Let's see some trial WASI questions on your screen. What are the major causes of inflation in your country? So if I use in Ghana, what are the major causes? It's up to you. Yes, state, write, it and write the question and state these major causes, having gone through what inflation is. Let's have another one. Explain three motives for holding money. Friends, take note that these are not any questions, but there are questions that have appeared in the WASI. All right? In the WASI. Distinguish between quasi money and commodity money. We talked about this, right? Where we say quasi money is near money, commodity money is using any commodity to serve as a medium of exchange. And we said with quasi money, you cannot use it to buy goods and services. But in this case, commodity money could be used to buy goods and services. So take note. I'll be writing the questions down, then you solve them. State four qualities of a good medium of exchange. A good medium of exchange. So in this case, we are talking about qualities of money, where we mentioned durability, portability, scarcity, and what have you. So write them, try to solve them. Now, to the last thing, financial institutions. And the financial institutions, we have a lot of them, but we'll be talking about the central bank, commercial bank, and development bank. Right. So, let us first tackle the central bank. It is a government-owned entity that is the head of all financial institutions and are responsible for the formulation of monetary policies. We've talked about the monetary policies. And the institution that spearhead the monetary policy is the central bank. 
And how did they do it? Before that, we talk about the functions of the central bank. They issue and redeem currency. So the currency of the various countries are issued by the central bank. And when they get old and ruined, the central bank will redeem them and replace it with new ones. It is the government's bank. The central bank acts like the government's purse. Whatever money governments get or whatever money comes in the name of government is kept by the central bank. And when government is going to borrow, when government is going to take any money or when there is any financial transactions in the name of the government, the central bank takes it up. It is the bankers' bank. The, bank, the commercial banks in our system also bank with the central bank. Yes, the central bank is open to only commercial banks. Yes, so take notes, mostly. And uh, take monetary policy, like I told you. Then they regulate, controls, and supervise activities of the financial institutions. So these are some of the functions of the central bank. I would want you to read more about this. The monetary policy instrument, we have what is called the open market operations. And that has to do with the sale and purchase of securities. We'll talk about that. We also have bank or discount rate, cash ratio, directives, moral suasion. Like I said, open market operation has to do with the sale and purchase of securities. Like I was telling you, if there is more money in the system, they will prepare the bond to go and extract money from the system. If there is more money in the system, they will make corporate entities prepare the bond. They will buy and push money into the system like that. Bank or discount rate is the interest rate which central banks lend commercial banks. So if they want more money to be in the system, they lower the interest rate so that people can borrow. If they want less money in the system, they increase the interest rate. Yeah. Then they also use the directives where it will just be a word of caution or it will just be something, an instruction which they will follow. Moral suasion, they speak to the, or they appeal to people or the commercial banks to either increase money supply or to reduce money supply. Now the contributions of the central bank. They provide employment. You know, a lot of people work with the Bank of Ghana. They ensure monetary stability. They facilitate international trade, mobilize resources for development. They mobilize loans for government. So, these are some contributions of the central bank. Let us quickly see what the commercial bank is. Then we bring this lesson to a close. It's a joint stock company or institution established for the purpose of making profit for its shareholders. That's the commercial banks. Ghana Commercial Bank is not the only commercial bank in Ghana. All the other banks like the APSA Bank, like UBA and what have you, they are all commercial banks, all right? Now these are the functions. Accept deposit, lend money to customers, act as trustees and guarantors. They offer financial advisory services to customers. I would want you to also know what Development Bank is. Lastly, it is a bank established to give long-term loans for development in some sectors of a particular economy. These are not the only financial institutions we have. There are a lot more. But for the sake of time, we had to talk about these three. Where we said central bank is the head of all financial institutions. We talked about commercial banks who work hand in hand with the central bank to implement monetary policies. And the development bank is a bank that gives long term loans to some sectors of a country. Friends, it has been a fruitful time with you, and I know you've learned a lot about these things. I would want you to take your time to go through the commercial bank, the central bank, the development bank, and the other financial institutions which may be of benefit to you as far as the WASI or your end of semester exam is concerned. Please keep learning as 
the slogan of joy learning is. And it is nice being with you till I come your way next time. It is bye for now.